And now, the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. All right, besides a couple of five-player games of Horizons, which I think you've all just heard enough about, uh, the big thing that happened this past week was our Level Up with Extra Life event at the CG Realm. Another one of our Road to Extra Life 2019 gaming events leading up to the big game day on November 2nd and 3rd. Now, at this event, we had local gamers running RPGs in four-hour time slots. We had one slot running from noon till 4 p.m. and another running from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And in the middle, we hosted an RPG book exchange, which also raised some money and got me some new stuff, including an unpunched copy of Silent Death, an old classic sci-fi war game. All right. Well, this was the third of our Extra Life event so far this year, and one step closer to our goals, as we were discussing earlier in the announcements. Yeah, we did pretty good. Um, originally, I had planned to run some games myself. That was the uh, the original idea, but the organizer, uh, again, Ian gave much out earlier, suggested that I sit back this year, relax, and actually play. Uh, that combined with the fact that, I gotta admit, we didn't have a lot of signups online, so I was worried we were going to have DMs without players. So I decided to sit on the other side of the screen this year, and I'm glad I did. Uh, for the noon session, I joined a game of Paranoia, ran by Randy McCall. Now, I've never actually played Paranoia before, though I did run the second edition of the game many, many years ago. The computer is your friend. <laughs> Are you happy, citizen? Please report for termination. Uh, the game Randy ran was an interesting mashup of the latest Paranoia edition, which came out uh, the last couple of years. It's called the Paranoia Red Box Clearance Edition. Or sorry, Paranoia Red Clearance Edition, and it's a box set. Um, and he kind of mashed that with the classic game I remember. Now, the reason for this is uh, the way Randy explained it is the new edition has significantly changed from what I grew up on. A major part of this change is swapping to a card-driven action system for all combat. Now, Randy noted that that made the game feel like a board game using that system, and he preferred more role-play-based style of play. Now, personally, without having tried the new system, it did sound somewhat limiting, so I was happy to play by Randy's house rules. Uh, we did use a bunch of the cards from the box set from the new system, and I did like what I saw of those. Uh, for example, we had cards for our roles in our teams. I was the happiness officer. Um, uh, we had a card for our secret society. Um, oddly enough, I didn't belong to one, but it strongly encouraged me to talk to the other troubleshooters to see if I could get into theirs. Um, our mutant powers were also on cards. Mine was Anomaly. And the most fun one was the equipment cards. We were each handed out a hand of four equipment cards that were assigned to us at the start of our mission that were specifically chosen by the computer and would obviously be vital to mission completion. All right. Well, you know what? It's it's such a such a throwback. We had a lot of really great weekends playing uh, Paranoia back in the day, and uh, it, it's crazy. But yeah, I, I had never realized until I was reading the show notes for tonight that no, you'd never played this game. Nope, never all played. the times we've gone in and and played and played and played, and you always DM them. Yep. I was the truth for almost everything back in the day. I was the DM. I was the one that owned the books. I ran all the games. So one of the major changes in the new edition of Paranoia, besides this card-driven system, we didn't really get to see is they tossed out the D20, which, man, that took some adjusting to. Uh, this is now a D6 dice pool system that reminded me the most of Tales from the Loop, uh, except in this, you're not just looking for sixes, you're looking for fives or sixes. Which is, and, and I get how that's jarring, but uh, what I find what a, what a system does with its rolling mis mechanic is more important than which rolling mechanic they it is they use you know uh, we were always so in love with the percentile from warhammer fantasy role play but that was really just kind of familiarity yeah. more than anything else you can you can get the you can achieve the same thing in a lot of different methods yeah very true yeah it's just uh, the, the mechanic the actual dice mechanic is probably one of the smaller things you can change in a game to have impact now the one thing that hasn't changed is uh the feel right uh, just how over the top silly post-apocalyptic dystopian setting with the the friend computer and always having to be happy in your bouncy bubble beverage and your insane robots and everyone wanting to hunt out traders who are members of secret societies and mutants while every player is a member of a secret society and a mutant right that hasn't changed it, it's the same craziness um 
I've always been a huge fan of Alpha Complex and Friend Computer and the insanity that ensues in this setting. Randy's game did not disappoint that way. Our game had us starting off as newly recruited level red level troubleshooters sent to Sector Hall Y Wood, uh, battling our clones against classic sci-fi creations, including Robbie the Robot, the Thunderbirds, and Dr. Satan. All right. Now, if I'm correct, they have actually eliminated the references to communists that used to be littered throughout yes. the game because we're no longer we're no longer Cold War era. So, though it seems like we may be heading back there, I think they well. could put communists <laughs> back in the 2019 edition and it would work. But yeah, um, Randy kind of glossed that over because I asked him that question. Uh, I think they just called them terrorists, which to me just for, I don't know maybe it's because I grew up in the 80s seems worse, where commie sounds seems funny and terrorist seems frightening. I, I, I'm thinking that's probably just my age showing, but yeah, he just, we just called them traitors, right. right? We were looking for mutant traitors and secret society traitors and traitors to the computer. Right. Uh, overall, I love the cards. I got to admit, I, I've always been a fan, right? I like Warhammer third edition, despite many people not liking it. Um, I like having stuff in front of me so I don't have to look up stuff in rule books. So they worked really well for the random equipment. That part was awesome. Um, the new dice system seems solid enough. Uh, there was something neat Randy was doing behind the screen where he had red dice and one of the sides was a computer logo. Uh, I meant to ask him about that, but when the game ended, we had other stuff going on. So I totally forgot to ask. Uh, the game was fun though. None of us lost a single clone. So I guess that part wasn't very paranoia like compared to the games I ran as a kid though. Uh, mostly I, it was fun, but I really curious about this new card driven combat system and this new almost board gamey version of paranoia. Um, I, if I didn't have like a pile of stuff that I already need to review and play, I'd be really tempted to go pick up this new edition. Yeah. It's to me, it's, it's interesting about that game because to me, the reason you have clones is because you're going to lose them. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm wondering if that's an, an oversight or babying the players. Uh, for me, uh, my instinct, if I were to be running a paranoia game, would be to lean more towards a TPK mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, no, leave that as a risk or, you know, one, one, one uh, citizen, you know, get it, I mean, blessed by the computer and yeah. making it through. Uh, that seems more them thematically on point than no, you know, we'll losing. Uh, I mean, just, I mean, there were, there were games where we, the first 10 minutes we were down on yes. our third clone. Yeah. Uh, admittedly, yeah, we I got a little crazy and that's excessive, but. Yeah, we our group very worked really well together, which is odd for paranoia, right? Plus, it was a charity event where if if I were Randy, I would have been pushing even more and trying to get people to donate, right? Oh yeah, because we allowed for cheating. So I donated a buck so I could be the happiness officer. I also cheated to get a certain piece of R and D, but like I fully expected to have to buy a seventh clone, and the game yeah. just didn't go there. Interesting. All right. Now, the other game I played at our Level Up event was a game of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Now, at this point, I still haven't read D&D 5e. Um, I did play in one convention game at Queen City Conquest, but that game was rather unique, uh, thanks, Andy, and not very traditional D&D game. That was something else. That was a little weird there. Yeah, it's right. The former D&D licensed DM has never actually played D&D yep. 5th Ed. Though, depending on who you are, you may be gasping or cheering. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There's going to be people who are happy I haven't actually sat down and learned 5th edition. There's going to be people who are probably like, what the heck? Yeah, I had that the, the DM running this game. He's like, come play D&D. &D. And I'm like, I don't know how to play D&D. &D. I'm like, well, I know how to play D&D, &D, <laughs> but I don't know how to play 5th edition D&D. &D. And you're like, ah, uh, there's, uh, there's no way that's true. And I'm like, no, I, I have the books. I haven't sat down. I don't even have all the books. I bought the starter set and I haven't even opened it. But anyway, uh, it's D&D. &D. All D&D &D is still D&D, &D, right? It's, it's like riding a bike. Uh, the game I played Saturday was a very traditional D&D experience. Uh, we had a party of four adventurers. We were hired to scope out an inverse pyramid in the middle of a desert. Uh, there was a scholarly society that wanted to get in there and archive and document and check out everything and be archaeologists. But they wanted to make sure there was it was safe first, so they sent a group in. Of course, the group that was sent in never returned, so our group was the backup plan. Well, a dungeon crawl concept at its finest. I mean, that's kind yeah. of what D and D was meant to be. Get yeah. in there and clean out that dungeon, you dirty rotten yep. adventurers. That's, that's exactly what it was. Uh, this game was mostly exploration and discovery, which was neat. Uh, there were a couple of combats, like only two main combats, and they were very trap filled. That made it interesting. It wasn't just walk up and hit with a sword. Uh, and then the game ended in a puzzle. Now the game was very well run. 
I had a pretty good time playing it, despite having to try to figure out a seventh level character without any real D&D 5e experience. Uh, but I was smart enough to choose a fighter. And I got to say, seventh level fighters aren't really all that complicated. It was pretty straightforward. All this weird stuff where you get to spend these expertise dice to do things. It's kind of neat. Uh, the game went well, I gotta say, except until the final scene, which ended in a direct puzzle, like a, you have to figure out the order to do the things and do them the right way or else bad things happen. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I haven't played D&D since Skills and Powers, uh, and I'd be interested to get my get a, a fifth ed character sheet and see if I would actually be able to sit down and play that character without tearing my hair out or asking a million questions, referring, you know, Googling madly yeah. before I could actually feel confident to sit down. It's it's interesting to see just how much that base mechanic of, you know, this is your character and you should be able to know enough about them from the character sheet uh, yeah. to, to get going. I, I think you'd have a hard time just because you never did third or 3.5 or four because second edition still used Thacko, right? right? It was a D20 system. You, you had a bunch of different saving throws like versus Rod, Staff, and Wand. It really changed up at third edition right. and then 3.5 four of all kind of evolved if you would play 3.5 you'd be fine right jump from second to fifth is is big in a way except for the style of play because right. the one thing fifth brought back is it's much more open it's much more relying on dm fiat and dm interpretation which was a big part of second edition so it plays more like second edition but mechanically there's a significant change there now thankfully i have played a lot of three i ran a campaign up to 13th level in 3.5 I ran over 200 games of fourth edition. So I'm no stranger to the D20 system right. that it's still based on. Right. That's fair. Which it's not a huge change. It's, it's, it's all you add. You, your stats don't matter. All that matters is the bonus they give you. And then you get a bonus in skills. I don't know how these bonuses are worked out in fifth edition, but they're on your sheet, right? Right. So it's, you look and it says roll intimidate. You look under intimidate. It says plus six, you roll a D20, you add six, right? Like it's not hard. Right. Uh, the big thing with this game that I do want to talk a bit about, and I, Sean may have some things to say on this too, because I'm not sure your feelings on this, is puzzle. Puzzles in any role-playing game. Because the problem I have with puzzles in any role-playing game is that they remove the role-playing. You're no longer role-playing once you're playing a puzzle. Once a puzzle's presented, you're now relaying on player skill and player ability and tossing out everything on that character sheet. It doesn't matter who my character is. Unless I do something silly like, well, my intelligence is only eight, so I'm not going to help solve the puzzle with the rest of the group. Like, there's really no way to tie it in. And yeah, we had the make a history check for a hint thing happen, but really it was up to us to solve the puzzle. And we failed. We never did figure out the puzzle at the end of this game. Well, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's something like an escape room in that way. Yeah. Um, and I think it's it's a lot of it depends on how that puzzle is crafted. Um, no, if you've got a straight brain burner, uh, and you've got, you know, a, a wizard and a priest and a fighter, uh, your fighter probably, unless he's got a, you know, high intelligence should probably be trying to figure out how to solve it with his sword. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's definitely that issue, but you know, sometimes when you play an escape room, you get walked out by the supervisor at the end. Um, yeah. and, and I think, I think if if it's set up that way where no you lost but you know you're still getting paid by the secret society because yep. they can go into the the dungeon now that it's safe and they're smart enough and they know all the clues already to solve this they just wanted you to get clear the path there um yeah. no you don't get get that extra bonus of feeling super special that you did the the <laughs> thing you weren't supposed to be able to do but you did everything you needed to do um yeah, I can see that. Because like in ours, we ran out of time, right? That's that's part of what happened. Uh, it, these were four-hour time slots with 15 minutes left in the time slot. We were stumped. Um, we had one party, party member down who may have actually solved the puzzle, but as far as we were concerned, they were done. They they were t they were dead, Right. though they were running a little separate thing. We called it a night. And uh, with the party down, we decided in-game, it made the most sense to do exactly what you said, is, well, we cleared the dungeon out. Let's leave and let the archaeologist solve it. Um. We did our part, right? Uh, it worked. Like, it, it was, it just, it wasn't a very rewarding, satisfying ending, especially yeah. for a one-shot, right? Like, I'm in a one-shot, and I kind of want that big... Well, you know, we have uh, we have talked end. about, you know, in, in previous episodes, how if you're doing a one-shot in particularly, this should be the best day of your character's yes. lives. Exactly. Um, and while this sounded like a darn successful event, uh, that's not the best day in your character's life. 
So yeah, that wasn't that wasn't the most memorable. I don't even remember my character's name, so that's a bad sign. That that seventh level fighter just went on to do his next thing. He didn't do anything cool. Right. I don't know. It was it was all right. It was the, like the rest of the game was great. I actually, like I said, in particular, I like the combats. The tactical combats with the traps were very well done. I like the puzzle aspects. Um, the DM's descriptions of the rooms and the evocative setting, like it was very much an exploration game. Like we were discovering this pyramid, which was really cool. Um, as an afterthought, uh, talk about linear. My God, it was all just one room after another. But so what? It worked right for what we were doing. It's a con game. I don't need to be able to explore a bunch of empty rooms, right? Yeah. And find all the right ways and find the secret doors. It was very much a straightforward dungeon, but that's fine. It worked. And like I said, the, the descriptions, the rooms, the setting that was set, there was absolutely a history to this place. All of that was great. Like uh, you talk about the pillars of D&D, exploration being one of them. That was very solid in this. And combat was also very solid. Just that puzzle, I, I personally wouldn't. If I had put the puzzle in, there would have been more things we could have rolled dice to solve it for. We could have, I would have made it more like a fourth edition skill challenge. But then I ran 200 games of fourth edition. <laughs> so it's just the way I think about D&D. &D. Right. Um, so far, though, like fifth ed seems good. Um, this was no exception. I'm glad I played. Um, I would sign up, play D&D &D again. As long as I'm with a group that's willing to let me be the noob who they now and then have to say, hey, you have this ability, you might want to use it. Because that did come up a couple times. I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, like, so, I'm like, I'm a fighter. What do I do? I just go hit it. And they're like, oh, no, no. You get to hit it twice. Read this. Oh, cool. I get to hit it twice. Oh, and then you can do this to hit it a third time. I'm like, oh, okay. So now we know you don't have time. And uh, there's, <laughs> there's not much RPG going on in any of our uh, no. lives lately. But having played it once at least and gotten a little bit of experience and seen some of the difference between four and five, would you? had you the ability to run fifth ed or would you, are you still a lover of fourth? Uh, no, I would, I would happily run fifth if I wanted to run D and D, but I have no, I don't want to run D. I want to run shadows of the demon Lord or <laughs> I want to run runaway hirelings or I want to run dungeon crawl classes. No, absolutely. I've just, there's D &D so much out there. D &D. Yep. Right. Like, yeah, there's just D and D's D and D. Now I'll admit my group, my Monday night group would love it. If I just went, I'll run D and D and we'll play fifth ed and it's familiar. I don't know. I, I personally would rather broaden my realm to something else. There's, there's so many other games out there. I want something more focused too. Like D and D is just so it's, it's generic high fantasy, right? Whereas if I do shadows of the demon Lord, that's got that Warhammer grim, dark striving against the darkness. That's what I like in my games. That's what I like to run. I'd much rather do that for a and d style game or do something totally different, like run Hydro Hacker Operatives, where we're playing Hydro Punk Robin Hoods trying to steal water from the corporation, right? See, Deanna saying there she wants to play. She wants to play AD&D Second Edition Skills and Powers, though, which I, I don't expect to run anytime <laughs> soon. See, and I'd be happy to get in on a DD and d Second <laughs> Skills and Powers Edition. Yes. Um, dial me in. Um, all right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right. Well, this weekend is uh, Jeff Seuss, patron of the show's wedding. So we are going to go to Jeff's wedding. Uh, well, I'll go to your wedding, too, if you know. No, no, this isn't a patron reward. <laughs> Jeff's a friend. He's a longtime friend. Um, we are going to Jeff's wedding. Um, he's going to have games there because, you know, he listened to our episode about having games at weddings and was like, damn, that's a good idea. Um, I'm personally going to be bringing Goku and Azul for people to play. So I expect to play some games at a wedding reception. Well, congratulations to Jeff and Sheila. Uh, best wishes. We've seen the game pile in our discord, yep. uh, for, for, uh, patrons, uh, and, and been involved in that discussion along the way. And then the week after that's the board game blitz. So I, it'll be a bad week for me talking about what I play. Cause I don't think I'll be playing anything, but for those of you who are local, come on out October 12th, this will be a big one. This is always a fun event. Five rounds, no elimination. You're going to get to play five different games and possibly win some CG Realm gift cards and support a good cause. All right. Well, we're taking a little step back into the lobby here. We've had a little bit of chat. Brian's joined us. Thank you for uh, popping in, Brian. And uh, a lot of chat about uh, a lot of chat about D and D because well, yeah. people are loving D and D. Uh, Brian had a great comment. Uh, playing D and D is like riding a bike with one advantage: riding two bikes and taking the better one. <laughs> uh, me riding a bike nowadays would be with disadvantage i think that's, that's, that's what would happen to me i do have to thank levi for joining us in the chat um my bad for not recognizing the name right away levi moat is actually the designer of horizons um i hope i wasn't too brutally honest i wasn't going to change my opinion because the designer was in the chat room uh so i said it as it is um i will send you that dm you requested later i don't know if you're still around if you Seems if you left after we were done your section or not but Thank you for joining us. Uh, he hung around long enough to mention that he loves uh, Silent Death. 
Oh, uh, see, that's a classic. Yeah, but I, but I think he popped out shortly after that. Uh, and understandable. Yeah, which is fair. Uh, again, that's fair. Absolutely appreciate them joining in. D and D's, sorry, D's agreeing that uh, yeah, not dying in paranoia is just weird. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, <laughs> Scott played with me too, and and I I played with people I don't always play with. Right, uh, Holly was there, and we played very conservative, but not in a safe conservative, but in a, like we weren't trying to screw each other over. And I kind of did it a bit with Scott, but I don't know Holly well enough. Right. And this one of the things we did not see at Extra Life was a lot of safety tools. So I didn't know how Holly would react to betrayal. And that's a game where there is betrayal, but I don't know the other players right. at the table. So I'm like, do I want to stab this person I don't know in the back in front of their face? Right. Because that's kind of what paranoia is about. No, so absolutely. Yeah. It, it's interesting. There, there were tables that did have a, have an X card. And there were a couple of discussions about safety tools, but it wasn't like when we go to breakout or when we go to the other cons and it's something that's present at every table. So. In my opinion, that's something that we need to work on for the next event. I want to talk to Ian ahead of time. And what I'll do is, I, you know what, it'll help us advertise. I'll put out branded X cards, you know? Yeah, no, Check absolutely. Out the yeah, you know, we have them out there. And... We are strong supporters of the X card. And uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's a little unfortunate, perhaps, to be, be dealing with an event that uh, that doesn't have them. No, it didn't. It's not that they weren't supported. It no, wasn't no. like they were there. But not everyone. Oh, we think it's dumb. No, dumb, no. But... but not everyone used them. And I think we're at yeah. a point now where that's just not okay anymore. Yeah. Um, it and to be to honest, know. if the X card was there, I would have done something against Holly because I know that safety mechanics there that she could have tapped it. And I would have been, all right. And then I probably would have said, why are you playing Paranoia? But <laughs> still. <laughs> nope. Yep. All right. 